Morton Villiers Warren is an industrial designer and founder of the world famous Native with CV and client list that reads like a who's who. Olufsen and Nespresso to name but a couple. As the principal designer of Bowers and Wilkins, Morton then worked for Philippe Stark and his unparalleled high standards of excellence and design output have won him a reputation for award-winning world-class product design. Let's meet the man behind some of the world's most cherished innovations. Morton, welcome to Designer Auto Podcast Studio. How we typically start the podcast is with an icebreaker. So you might have brought along a product or if you haven't brought along a product, if you can share something. I don't know. Um, there's a, a car I'm saving up to buy. Uh, and one day, hopefully, uh, when I kind of, when I'm not so busy, I'll get the opportunity. Uh, it's an old Lancia Aurelia B24 Spider, which is a, a car I've always had a, a, a just a, a passion for it's not your typical sports car but it's beautifully engineered and it's just when you look at it it's quintessentially Italian and it just possesses uh, incredible beauty um, and one of the one of the sort of objects I suppose as, as a child and growing up that inspired me to to get into design so at some point in my life it'd be great to actually acquire one Watch this space. Go around Italy with it or something. Watch this space. So, so one of the prerequisites for you when you're making a choice about purchasing something is what? Oh, I've got to feel. I'm quite a difficult person to live with because everything I, if I have to buy something, it has to go through interrogation and a complete sort of rigor of. Is it going to last long? Is it just styling or is it has it got integrity? And that makes it quite difficult if you're sort of uh, you know, you want to buy something online quickly. And I'm 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 of the view that things should be bought to last and I don't like uh throwing things away. And I'm afraid over the last 20, 30 years, we've created a very throwaway culture mm -hmm. where products are not created to to have much integrity. Well, and fast fashion. Yeah, yeah. It's mm. um, And I think as we, we realise now, we're paying the price and we've got to correct it. So when you are curating a home, for example, when you're buying, I don't know, cutlery or something for a home, mm. for you, your the values that, that, that you need to satisfy are durability functionality t t tell me them talk me through them well i think first of all it's got to do something for you so you've got to have that attraction um and that's always a difficult thing it's something i've had to fight it's so subjective yes. visual appeal yes and it's it's just a chemical thing right uh and and it just triggers so yeah in fact talking about cutlery i, I was a very painful experience <laughs> i wanted to buy something of really quality but something that was incredibly beautiful. And it was really actually quite hard looking at all the different brands. Um, so yes, you end up selecting something that's beautiful. But then after you've found something that's beautiful, you really want to then look at it and interrogate it and understand how well is it made? What's its, you know, is it plated? Is it, is it you know, can you dishwash it? So this uh, is the functionality. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and that can go through to whether you, I mean, one of the veins of my life is cleaning equipment. I mean, if you've ever bought a mop or a, uh, a dustpan and brush, they're the worst designed things I've ever come across in my life. Why? You get through, well, because we get through one or two a year and they just, and you try to find something of quality that will be well engineered and designed well. And there's German brands, there's brands from all, and they all fail. They're just terribly, terribly designed. So one day we'll, I actually started to record and take photographs of all the things that we end up throwing out of our house just to kind of understand what's the most, um, you know, uh, poorly designed. And it is, when you look at mops and, and dustpans and brushes, they, I mean, it's a weird subject to be talking about. No, I am. Um, I you know love this. I, mean? I love kind of, this subject. You know, yeah. And what I feel <laughs> is I want Native, which is your brand, which mm. we're going to talk about in a minute. Mm. I need you to create a book, please. Right. I need to know what are the best products to be buying for our homes, for our lives. I mean, you've just come into the podcast studio today in a phenomenal looking, what is it, a fold-up fold bike? 
Yes. And I want to know everything about the bike. Yes, yeah, so the lightest you've bike in the world, yes. Right, it's the lightest <laughs> bike. You And this book will take all the right. hard work out of the selection process. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea, actually, yeah. Um, where, Morton's you know, Guide yeah. to Living. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think, um, I, as I say, I, th I think that it is important um, that that we have an understanding of how things are made and whether you can, you know, when I grew up, I, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather who was in the First World War, not in the Second World War, and he would keep everything in his shed. He wouldn't throw anything away, even down to nails that would be pulled out of pieces of wood. And there was this, you know, and if the kettle broke, you'd go and repair it and fix it. And, um, and that's totally changed in a really bad way. So I, I'd love to design the 50 year kettle or the 100 year toaster or something or you know products that we that we use every day and actually have them guaranteed for 100 years so you pass them down wouldn't that be great yeah but i want to tell you what what does socrates <laughs> say about that the secret of change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the old morton mm. but on building the new yeah, but I think that would say that, you know, if you come across an oak tree that's been, you know, in a, in a field for, you know, 500 years, uh, it, it, it builds, you know, patina, it has history, it has, it has uh, you know, a, a richness that you don't necessarily get. I, I'm all for new, but when it's needed and when necessary. When it's needed. Yes. Don't, br don't, what, what's that saying? Don't fix something that's not broken yes don't uh, if it ain't broke don't try don't, and fix it. i love yes. that yeah. okay nuts and bolts of what you do okay because i am so excited mm. to meet an industrial designer now you are different are you not to an inventor well um are you I think inventing we, we, or reinventing no we invent all the time I, I mean certainly at my firm native we are not a styling house and I, I would say styling would be, let's say, you get a motorbike and, you know, th three years later, you need to create a new motorbike and you just style it. And maybe it's got a few little technical details, but it, you just restyle it. For me, that's never really um, interested me that much. I've always liked to go back to the basics and look at how can we actually improve a product so when we've designed headphones in the past mm. you know we've looked at in fact the first headphones we ever designed were for a company called bowers and wilkins and they were called the p5 love the brand right yeah well we're behind virtually everything that they've ever made <laughs> over the last 25 years um but uh, the p5 is what, what a lot of people don't realize is that they've been designed to disassemble so at the end of life all the all the components that go into this product can be uh, uh, taken apart and recycled. And we thought of that, we designed that about 18 years ago. So it's like quite a long time so ago. So we're quite, quite ahead of our time in terms mm. of thinking about um, sort of life cycles and things. But also it's a, it's a headphone that has long lasting appeal. You look at it and it's timeless. It's like a piece of, you know, like a Anna Jagbson piece of furniture or, you know, it's got a, it's got a real, um, simplicity about it and when you look at the myriad of headphones that are out today you know there's like every year there's something else new coming out but actually I don't know t to my mind it's great if you can create something that has that longevity I think that that's the real success of good design and you, I mean you talk about in industrial design but actually we cover um, the full gamut of design which would be what's the experience you want to create so whether that's mm a cupboard door that you want to open in a beautiful way that maybe hinges down and articulates, you know, into the, into the cabinet. I like that's the all, you know, that that's the clap ones. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, it's about, so for us, it's about the uh, designing the entire experience. Um, and that isn't just the way it looks, but it's how it's made, but also how does it feel? How does it, feel? How does it move? Has it got elegance? So we try to, to consider, Absolutely everything, even over into the digital domain as well. See, it makes no sense, kitchen cabin cabinetry to me. You're in a kitchen, you're chopping, you're touching food. Why would you then touch with dirty fingers mm. the cupboards, which is why I just yeah. love that whole yeah. clap and it will open, yeah. clap three times and it will close. 
How fascinating. So now, when we started the podcast, you mentioned to me that you are very tricky to live with. But what I'm thinking mm. is, actually, these high standards that you have, instead of calling yourself tricky to think it's tricky to live with, these high standards that you operate via, I wonder if these have been learned from being a child, which you're then able to very successfully implement into your business, which is why you have become this right. massive success. Um, hmm. Uh well, I, all I know is I, I used to enjoy making things, building things. I used to win Lego competitions did you? when I was a kid, yes. Um, what did I you did, build? Oh, goodness me, uh, um, ships and spaceships and all sorts of interesting, all sorts of things. Um, and But also, actually, when I look back, there was always a bit of innovation in there as well. I would have sliding doors and things, not not your regular door. You know, you'd have to have or a, a roof that kind of dynamically opened and a helicopter could land inside or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think that... Um, I, I, I think it was actually my father was uh, an inventor. He, um, he... So when I grew up, um, we had sort of electronics on the breakfast table you know sort of resistors and toroidal transformers and smell of soldering irons you know while I was eating my cornflakes and he um he sort of co-invented in recording studios you have a needle that moves up and down as, as you're recording so he came up with the idea of LEDs so back in the sort of 60s of having the LEDs going up and down as you measure sound wow. so as a kid I would sit in the car and he'd go to sort of um, uh, Brian Ferry's house recording studio or something and put them in and then he would be at the BBC or he'd meet ABBA and, you know, put them in ABBA's recording studios and things. Um, and so that was um, kind of an interesting uh, experience as a kid, just seeing, I suppose, uh, what it's like to actually make something and then sort of install it and sell it and, um, I suppose, constantly innovating and improving. You know, so. so how did your career unfold then from the kitchen table and seeing your father... Um, yeah, I, so I think I think there's a healthy interest in technology, you know, uh, and I remember him telling me when I was about like seven years old, one day you'll listen to music and you'll plug in your headphones to a Yorkie bar, right? And if you think about that, that was probably like 19, I don't know, 75 or something like that, to be aware of what was coming. He was ahead know, of the curve. Really ahead already. of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's, uh, I think, um, so I think that's, that's been quite helpful but look it, it isn't just technology I'm you know I think experiences um, are really important that you have successful experiences and that's whether you're searching for something on the internet and you know that the the navigation on that website is really interesting engaging or whether it's you know interacting with a touch screen and the gestures and the movements that you put into the into the the, uh, the design is you know very intuitive mm. so yeah so we, we do a lot of work with, um, uh, sort of, I suppose, researching and understanding where the pain points are in a customer journey, for example. Can you give me an example of one of your favourites? There's, well, there's a piece of work we did quite a few years ago for a company called Coloplast. I'm still to this day very proud of. It's um, a Danish intimacy care, well, it's a medical device company, it makes stoma bags, you know, and if you're unfortunate enough to have you know, a spinal injury or, um, you know, uh, uh, an operation where, you, you know, you've got these bags for the rest of your life. And if you look at, if you look at them before we came along, they looked like ghastly things from the Stone Age. I mean, I really just the most awful looking objects. And um, we, um, we re totally redesigned them, made them out of a beautiful fabric that doesn't have any friction with the skin. And actually, sort of, I suppose, um, put a integrity back uh, uh, into into people who have got these these problems and um and the work we and when we see the success of the company that that's been had i mean their share price increased like 500 oh, percent you know they, they, that's they, wonderful you know, they be, they're the market leaders now um and i think we we put um that sort of um yeah that attention to to that subject matter in a way that that it deserved and um, so yeah very proud of that because i think we've really put dignity back into into their lives so, so I'm, I'm curious about your your process because it sounds to me very um that you have a marketing um a marketing focused process in the sense that um at the heart of any redesign any design mm. um the customer's needs are 
you know, one of your primary concerns, mm. you know, when you're create, recreating the, these bags that you talk about and you talk about the textile, mm. you know, being close to the skin. Mm. Can you explain, like, if you have uh, almost like a standardized process? Um, look, I, I think it, it's a process of constant um, inquiry, you know, uh, a, a process where you rather than go and sit around a table and try and design something, you actually go and talk to patients, spend time with them, actually go and live with them and see, oh, and this is one thing I think, you know, really good designers, and, and I, I have to say, I use that because I, I remember doing a talk for British Council many years ago in China, and I was showing a football match, actually, a Manchester United soccer team uh, playing a, a game of football and talking about how, you know, Everyone can kick a football about, but how do you get to the Premier League? Everyone's got technical skills, but what's the difference between those players in the Premier League? Ooh, you know? Good analogy, yeah. And, and, and it's their creative ability. And so when we talk about design, there's an awful lot of designers. Everyone can design, think. But I th at Native, we've tried to attract the very best talent, and that talent is across the board in the way that they think, the creative, their desire to um, push the boundaries so so in that example um, you know uh, going to live with a family who have let's say stoma and watching how they're embarrassed how they want to hide some of the the you know the equipment because the you know their daughter might see it etc and by those observations you then feed that back into the process to say okay now let's solve those problems as opposed to the old days where designers would come in and sort of go, ta-da, here's our idea. And it's like the artist, you know. Um, and that's great, but it doesn't necessarily solve problems because you've got a kind of an egocentric view of solving those problems. And that's interesting, yeah. isn't it? So, so, so for me, yeah, what I'm hearing is as an industrial designer, you are solving problems. Elegantly, beautifully, yeah. um, constructively. With yeah. consideration. Yes, but that doesn't, that's not always, I mean, there's a lot of products you can see that do that, but they're boring as hell. So you also have to have a touch of flair. And it's, you know, my time spent at Stark Studio all those years ago was, you know, a Philippe touch. Stark. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, a touch, you've got to have also, and this is where the skill of very gifted designers will be, that solves those problems, but it does it with such beauty such elegance that um that it puts a smile on your face give me an you know? example of a design that puts a smile on your face well i'm very proud of us the zuma product that we've created oh, yeah. um because the speakers when, yeah when you sh see how it goes up in a ceiling and you use our blade system it's a very unique patented um way in which it holds itself in the ceiling everyone smiles and everyone says oh my god that's genius and it's great to see um, that effect on on everyone who comes across it. You know, so, so. so talk me through the experience. Okay, so look, designing audio products all my life, you know. Um, Bang and, and Olufsen. Yeah, some, some of the best products. Um, Bows and Wilkins. Yeah, some of the best products in the world. Mm -hmm. But but actually, my personal view is I always felt a bit disappointed. And I'm lucky enough to have them at home, right? The reality is you have to sit in a particular position. You have to move all the furniture in your room and have these huge things left and right and sit in the middle and then close your eyes. And yes, you can have this incredible sort of recording studio experience. And that's how they're being designed. They've been designed so they're trying to replicate what's being reproduced in a recording studio. But no one lives their lives like that. You know, you're in the kitchen, you might lay on the sofa, you'll sit over here. No one actually sits right, unless you're going, even when you go to the theatre, you know, the chances are you might be sitting in, you know, the left or the right, you're never dead centre. So that observation was like, how do I, I want great sound everywhere, not just in my living room, I want it in the bathroom. Why can't I have a bath, listen to some beautiful opera, dim the lights and just relax? Or when I'm cooking, can't I just be immersed in incredible, you know, soundtrack? So we looked around and we kind of think, well, we can't put hundreds of loudspeakers in someone's homes. They're the just ugly, annoying objects. They're actually quite alien in a home, you know, when you compare to a piece of furniture or a piece of sculpture. 
And I was looking up at the ceiling and noticed that we've got lots of ceiling lights. And there's lots of lots of them and everywhere you go. In fact, it turns out there's about six billion ceiling lights around the world. <laughs> and I sort of thinking, well, why does a light only just be a light. Why can't it do more than that? So that's how we. Clever. Yeah. So now it looks just like a ceiling light, a tiny little recess ceiling light, and yet it has the most amazing high performance loudspeaker that we engineered ourselves. It's part of it's made in the UK. Um, and actually, you need to come and hear it. Yeah, I'll, uh, we'll have to organize something because everyone who hears it says, oh my God, that is amazing. Because you are bathed in sound are you the, you know? the first guys putting the We're technology the world, the world, behind lights? it's the world's first yes uh, it's and it sounds uh it's a totally different experience to listening to a pair of speakers or listening to a sound bar because you populate the entire ceiling if you've got lots of lights and you it's not like a ceiling speaker because a ceiling speaker you put one in a corner over there and you put another one in the corner there and that's what generally what most houses have um, it's very expensive also if you put ceiling speakers, you have to put cables in and you've got a big rack system and the whole thing is very convoluted and incredibly expensive, time consuming and disruptive. Zoomers, you just if you've got lights, you just take your old lights out and you put ours in. You Genius. don't have to change you don't have to change your light switch or anything. So it makes sense. It is I mean it's it's completely thinking outside of the yeah. box. But going back to the blades, what we notice when you take a light out the ceiling it rips half your ceiling apart. Yeah. The, it's got these horrible clamps and half the plaster all falls over yeah. you. We wanted to solve that problem. So we have these beautiful blades. You put the, the light in and then you just pull these blades out and then the whole thing is clamped in. If you want to remove it, put the blades back in and the whole thing just falls out. It doesn't touch your ceiling. Give this man a job. <laughs> <laughs> that is spectacular. Okay. I mean, But I can't phenomenal. emphasize the sound is is something to be, we, we've, we've Someone in the in the music industry uh, in in Hollywood has just had them put in uh, his uh, his house, and uh, we got an email back. He's got fifteen in his kitchen, and he said uh, the sound is phenomenal. And he's in the music industry, Beautiful. so we're very yeah very pleased with that. That's that's an, that's an accolade for your CV. Wow! Congratulations. So, any products out there you wish you had redesigned, invented? Well, I mean, first, really proud. We're working with a company called Illumina, who make the DNA sequencing machines that actually have been used to sequence the COVID uh, d disease. Which um, really, I mean, you know, really proud to be associated with. I mean, the importance of mankind depending on that technology, and we've been around, you know, to help design those those equipment. Um, uh, we up uh, another another piece of work we've was really really quite. Um, great experiences working um, with Ford on really looking at the the experience of um, a fully autonomous electric car and how do you you know how can you reconsider the car completely and um, we did an amazing amazing project where we really almost like designing an interior design you know the 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 whole idea is you know if you're let's say you're traveling on your own car is going to pick you up from the airport i'd like it on, on the app the on the app the car will actually reconfigure its interior for you if you're on your own right it'll make it really no. spacious okay it'll make an office okay. if you fancy doing if, some work yes uh, and if you're with a family it the, the seats actually expand and contract um and rotate and move in order to to be the perfect environment for for whoever's going inside. It was really amazing. We built it for real and we shipped it over to Detroit and it was presented at the Piquette factory, which is the factory where they first made the Model T. And we had, um, yeah, with the CEO of Microsoft came to see it. It was, um, it was yeah, I think um, a, lot of, a lot of executives uh, from all around the US um, came to see this incredible vision. Um, so yeah, we get involved in a lot of um, exciting, um, a lot of exciting projects. Oh, that's that's another mind blowing mm. project. So so my background's marketing. I did a degree in marketing, and um, and I'm interested in, in this whole kind of um, area of um, R and D. You know, investment in research and development, mm. and 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 
d design, you know, progressive design as it were. One of my first brands I worked for was Kodak, who now no longer exists. Mm. And, and I remember working with the R&D guy um, on some new technology and, and he was an old guy with a beard and mm. he just looked like somebody that lived down in a cellar that nobody talked to. Mm. And, you know, fast forward to now, and I remember reflecting on that period thinking, I wonder if that is why the company, you know, no longer exists because our, you know, this, this, this industry that we're talking about, this sector that we're talking about requires significant investment mm. and faith. You know, mm. in potentially things being designed that don't get launched, that, mm. you know, that, that, that go by the wayside. Mm. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that's why Kodak's gone down, gone down the pan, because they didn't invest in the future. Oh, I mean, it's, um, I think uh, there's many companies that um, do badly because they don't invest in R&D. With, with Kodak, I... I I have no idea, mm. you know, it was unfortunate that basically moving from an analog world mm. to a digital world, you know. Um, but it is the way the world is built at the moment. Um, you've got a lot of industries uh, th that are financially driven and will literally, there's companies we've worked with where the company has been stripped of everything literally has nothing left can't innovate can't even make can just about make the product that it's actually selling because the investors who were owners and you see that you know asset strip and literally make the company as lean as they possibly can to make it look as profitable and it's it has a consequence mm. and we've seen that time again in a lot of companies we did i mean the reason why we we've done zuma is because a lot of the projects that we get to work on uh, sometimes they are killed right they they just they doesn't matter how good they were they're killed and it might be because the ceo has left moved to another company it might be that um there's a change in direction in the business and actually you know innovating is really difficult and risky um and we decided with zuma that we thought that this was something that we were going to go mm. to ourselves and um Something that it's, you believed in, that you're passionate about. Yeah, and I, I think the time, and also the time was right, you know, um, that we wanted, and I've learned a hell of a lot on, on what it takes, not just to design, manufacture, but also, you know, you've got to sell, you've got to market, you've got to, you've got to uh, raise investment. Um, it's, it's, it's the full, the full Monty. Mm. Um but you're in there and it's it makes life very interesting. I'm curious about the personality traits of somebody that is able to innovate, somebody that's able to think about the future. And I've got I've got this vision in my mind that the people that kind of work for you or maybe Elon Musk, you know, they they sit in dark rooms and listen to really loud music and I don't know what they're smoking or drinking. Who knows? I mean, what what does it take to to to, to be somebody who, you know, doesn't have a box. And obviously I've made up, you know, the conditions of, of how your staff yeah, work. No, I, I'm sure I they work in lovely I, offices. I don't, I don't um, live in a dark room or anything. <laughs> I actually like the sunshine. So. But um, look, I think you've got to be very um, single-minded and, and have a vision and you've got to be, you've got to be relentless and have a lot of tenacity. And I have to say, you know, there's a lot of people in this world who, who, who have that, but they put it in other things like running marathons or, or looking after, um, you know, um, uh, people in hospitals, etc. I mean, you know, it's across the board. It just so happens that building a, a, a business and, and growing a business and then having the, 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 the mindset and determination to go and um, manufacture and, and um, develop uh, a product that's never existed before. Mm. I mean, yes, I think, you know, you've got to be slight. I mean, I know I'm dyslexic and I'm probably on the spectrum somewhere of complexity. Good. Um, but, um, but, I, but I think, you know, as Steve Jobs, uh, you know, always says, it's the, it's the crazy ones who, who change the world. Mm. And, um, uh, yeah, I like to think I'm slightly crazy. I'm sure a lot of people who work for me know I am crazy. Mm. In <laughs> so, the nicest you know. possible meaning of the word, exactly. I hope so. Yeah. What, what what resources do you pull? Are you pulling on as 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 kind of you know inspiration? 
um, th that you just don't take no for an answer. You know, the the easy route out is to kind of change or make a compromise. And sometimes you just have to stay the mile and just keep it going, you know. And um, uh, during this time with COVID, you know, launching uh, Zuma was, you know, a very, very difficult period. Um, How so? You know, raising investment and everyone, no one can come and see you because everyone's, you know, terrified of, uh, you know, this this uh, uh, awful uh, disease. So, um so yeah, you 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 know it's um, uh, what can I say? Uh, you you need a little bit of luck as well, you know, and and a bit of faith in in that that it will that doing the right thing will somehow happen, you know. Mm. And and trade shows, publications, mm. mentors. I mean, I was reading about what's the guy Raymond? Is it Lovey? Who designed the locomotive? A oh, Roman Lowy, yes. Yeah, Lowy. Yeah. Like mm. inspiration, men mentors. Yeah, he wouldn't have been a, an inspiration for me, unfortunately. He was a styling guy, from my view. I mean, kind of very iconic things that he created. But you know, I like very much. Um, you know, if you look at the wishbone chair by Hans Wegener, I mean, it's in every architect's you know interior. But it's a beautiful chair. You can't actually really. That I've seen copies now, and there's all sorts of variants of. But it is a, an exceptionally beautiful. But if you read about the history of it, it's merging um, uh, Oriental uh, aesthetics with Western, and it's using Western technology at the time, um, and it was very innovative as well. But that chair lasts. I mean, it's well, I don't know, it's sixty years old or something, and it's still as beautiful today as mm. it was. So I, I find those things quite um, inspiring. But at the same time, I also find no, I think what um, what Johnny Ive has done at Apple is exceptional. Uh, the the quality and the obsessiveness and intention to detail is absolutely spot on. And um, in fact, you know, they 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 set the mark, which I think uh, to a lot of uh, designers uh, act as a as a kind of an inspiration. I think um, in the, in their the quality of. You know, not just the physical design, but also the the intuitiveness and the ease of use, etc. So, you know, in a lot of a lot of the um, projects that we've been involved in, I mean, we've worked with Pernod Ricard, for example, making um, um, uh, cocktail uh, machines. You know, which are postable, uh, which was a really fascinating uh, project, which uh, ended up in essentially postable cocktail yes shoes. yeah yeah how does that work so uh, you know what we observe is you know when you go to a, a, someone's if you look at entertainment at home um it's mainly you know you go to someone's house you might have a glass of wine some champagne prosecco or whatever uh, but you very rarely have cocktails it's really only when you go out you have a cocktail so how can we address that um, and we wanted to get rid of the glass bottle because we found certainly in 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 China, um, going to a supermarket and coming home with a big glass bottle, you know, in big apartment blocks is quite a not not a great thing to do. Um, Why? Because it's heavy, or it's heavy. It's, it's um, you know, and, and and you don't you and and the, a glass bottle is as dumb as anything. It doesn't. You can't do anything. Um, so we created sustainable, a uh, postable. Uh, drinks that go through the letterbox but actually when they come together and they sit on this tray uh, with an app on your phone they can sh show you how to they give you exactly the right pour we developed a you know, pump system which was completely um, uh, novel and um, able to deliver the, precisely the right pour for a, a whole range of cocktails so if you could get your hands on any brand yeah, any existing product or something that you've, well, you, you probably don't want to tell us about kind of future innovations, mm. like any existing product that you could get your hands on and kind of spin your magic. Oh, improve. Um, Maybe a product, a home product that just doesn't make sense for me. This soundbar. Is I hate soundbars. I think, look, I grew up where the TV was like an engine in your house, right? It was this huge CRT, the biggest thing. The most important thing as well in the home, right, was this TV. And, you know, here we are 20 years later. Interesting enough, 
no TVs are made in Europe anymore. They're all made in, in Far East. And I think cars will be the same way when they be, all become electric and, and batteries. Um, the, um, and we have the beautiful flat TVs, right? They're like a painting on the wall. And you've got a sound bar with it. <laughs> it. It's like going to Savile Row and having a beautiful suit made and then walking around with Wellington boots. You know, it's just, it's the stupidest thing. Mm. So I... I well, you've, got um, this, you've got your product now, the Zuma product. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, what's beautiful about that is that you've just liberated your, even just, just your viewing of the movie, you don't have to look at any other object, right? You just have the TV. And if you want to move the TV and put it somewhere else in the room, you can. You're not bound by this massive, you know, massive stuff. So... Uh, a soundbar is, is definitely something um, we need to get rid of. It, it, it's um, speakers, full stop, we need to get rid of in the home. Mm. I, I have to say, like, if you look at the smartphone uh, or the iPhone, before the iPhone came along, you'd have to have your cell phone, your pager, your digital camera, your, um, you know, your, your MP3 player, whatever, right? You have a whole mass of objects. And iPhone came along and brought all of those things together. And you wouldn't really now think of going out and buying a, a, a Walkman MP3 player or a, um, a camera because it's all built into your phone. So in the same way with, with Zoomer, if, you've got a, if your home has got Zoomers in it, that's it. You don't have to worry about buying a speaker ever again. Don't have to worry about lights ever again. Don't have to worry about even your alarm system or your smoke alarm or your temperature sensor or your... Whatever it's, we have the capability of building that all into our Zoomers. So it's an incredibly powerful platform. My challenge mm. is not with your product; mm. it's with the technology that is required to work the product at forty-nine and a half years old. Mm. I find the whole automation thing very complicated. Yes, yeah. And please, could you work your magic? What do you have? Do you have at home? Do you have one of these? Complicated rack systems or what? what complicated do you, alarm systems. Right, yeah, yeah. Complicated uh, water system, complicated right. irrigation systems. Yes. Oh, irrigation. Oh, that TV. actually, you know, you're asking me about what I'd like to redesign. Irrigation system. How? Because they're impossible to use. I, do, I, I tried to put on our irrigation system the other day. It's like designed by a madman. It's just how many dials and how many do what? I mean, all I want to do is turn it on. Yeah. It's impossible. Yes. Yeah. Irrigation is a good one. And also all the little things pop off and you can't ever, the thing never works properly. Never works properly. Yeah. And also sometimes I'd like to just get home and have the hot water on a certain time and off at a certain time. And the whole, just the automation behind yeah. the technology, for me, uh, you know, maybe I'm reaching mm. the wrong side of, you know, wrong side of life the age. well our, our vision with zuma and it should be possible really quite soon if you've got a home with zuma um even before you've got home zuma understands what mood you're in okay i like that so Smart when you get technology. when you walk through the door mm. the lighting is at the right ambience it's got the right atmospheric sound playing and it's there just to make life easier yes. for you you know, um, and there's absolutely no reason why we can't do that. And it should be really beautiful and simple. Mm. Um, I don't understand today why I've got to get home. And I've got, I've got this incredibly complex light system where you press a button. It takes 10 <laughs> seconds for the lights to come on. You know, it's just, yeah. Toilet seats also. Bane. Don't I, go there. I have an 11-year-old yeah. son. Bane of my life. Yeah, no, you are, Why I have to nobody... say, it hasn't gone amiss. It's been on my list. And uh, commercially, tick, that's going to be viable because most people in their offices' homes have probably, I don't know, three each. Yeah, no, it's a good one. Very well observed. I, uh, I, I've often thought that they are in need of completely rethinking because they don't work. So, so if you think 30 years ago, you know, when we had the freestanding speakers and then mm. f in the homes and fast forward now, you've got them, you know, incorporated in your lighting systems. What do you think has been the motivations for this for this evolution? So, yeah, I mean, 30 years ago, you think of we had the CD, you know, <laughs> player and actually your hi-fi was actually a major thing in people's homes. You'd come in and there'd be some big rack system sitting in the middle of the living room and a huge big box speakers left and right. Um, we know that you know there's a lots of reports and, and data that say look people want they want sound everywhere right they want great music or podcasts or whatever it is they want convenience um, 
And technology up until today has meant it's really been split in two. You've got the wealthy who have got a lot of money and can afford to put a lot of technology that gets integrated into the home. And that is cables and all sorts of convoluted technologies that end up with a big, huge rack in a cupboard somewhere, taking up quite a lot of space, burning a lot of energy, by the way. Um, and then for some integrator to kind of create these kind of um, rather, again, convoluted interfaces, which somehow mix all these fragmented things, whether that's your lighting, your security, your home entertainment, your temperature sensing, your your curtains or blinds that go up and down. And they what they try and do is integrate that into some kind of system. They hardly ever work very well. You have to pay a lot of money to have an engineer come and fix it every five minutes. Um, and for most people, they can't afford it. For people who can't afford it, it's a kind of white plastic kind of John Lewis accessories solution, um, which is you're on your own, here it is, plug it in and off you go. But actually you end up with a load of clutter and a load of mess around the home. So I think what, what's happened today when you look at the sort of uh, wireless technology, Wi-Fi technologies, at Zuma we've hired some of the best people in the industry Again, no one in the world has been able to do this before, but to use Wi-Fi to create a complete um, system around your house that brings light and sound together effortlessly. Um, and that wasn't possible even five years ago. It's having all, of, all these things have to be sort of aligned at the right time. Again, go back to the sort of iPhone example touchscreen capability, the ability to make those displays really thin, um, you know, the ability to have the networks that could create the data that could go to the phones. So everything has to be at the right place at the right time. So for Zoomer, it really is cutting edge, leveraging also LED lighting technology. We've had to do a lot of work to get the heat out of the lights, so that our lights will last 12 to 15 years. They don't you know, you don't have to change a bulb. You don't have to worry about them um, um, not working. So, um, so yeah, uh, so what's happened, the change uh, is understanding all these different technologies and bringing them together all at the right time. I also so. feel like it frees up time for people to do other things as well. The advancements in technology and the simplification of the over-engineered ways that we used to do life mm. have freed up time so we can engage in different activities and more activities nowadays. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, the last thing you want to do is be sort of, you want to watch a, a movie and you want to be fiddling around with a remote control and trying yeah. to get stuff to work. I right? want I mean, my TV so, to, yeah. to tell me what I want to watch. Oh, well, that's a, that's another one we've done projects with with uh, with companies like Disney and people like looking at how much time people spend not deciding on, or can't decide what to watch, right? Waste so you end up sitting like an hour and a half, you know, and then you all go off to bed because you haven't even watched anything. Arguments with your yeah, partner, yeah, yeah. never get that half an hour yeah, back in no. my life. So, yeah, sometimes choice can be better. But um, convenience, I think convenience has been an overriding desire, but I'm also interested in the quality. What, what would be great is you have something that's more convenient but it's even better to experience and use. Mm. And that's great because I think otherwise we end up in a life where we've got everything's easy, but it has no value. It has it doesn't do anything for you. I think it's nice if you can make something that's incredibly convenient, but actually enriches your day, makes you feel better. So in for example, with Zuma, we've got a thing called circadian rhythm built into our lights. Circadian rhythm is something that's linked to our sort of natural, um, human-centric way of... Sleeping. Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's daylight, essentially. And so, you know, thousands of years ago, we have grown up in daylight. We never had artificial light. So our body clocks, everything we do is driven by what we've experienced, you know, from the morning, the, the temperature of the sun in the morning, all the way through the afternoon and into the evening. Most people's houses have got a light in there and they have no idea what temperature it is. So you could, I've been in houses where, you know, you're in an environment and it's in the evening and it's, and, and it's essentially the lights are telling you that it, it's, you know, uh, morning time. 
Hmm. And so how on earth are you going to get to sleep if, if the light is telling your brain uh, the opposite? So a lot of studies have been done there, and we've made that a really important feature within Zuma that our lights are gradually changing in their color temperature throughout the day so that by the evening, you haven't even had to touch anything, a lovely, warm, evening sun color in, in, you know, in your bedroom or in your living room, et cetera. So, um, and then when you mix that with sound, you can create these incredible soundscapes. So we've got the ocean, or we've got, you know, um, sort of uh, Amazon rainforest or on the savannah. So you, you know, lay in bed and I'm reading a book and in the background, I've got this incredible sound and it's not coming from a little speaker over there or sound over there, it's just all around you. Is this sort of canopy of, you know, incredible sound. It's very uplifting. And um, um, it's something that, again, you know, so so simple things like that, I think could be really rewarding. And we want to um, want to try to bring that that um, into into people's lives. I could go. I need <laughs> I need to see a copy of your book, Morton's Guide to Stylish Living. I right. have loved meeting you. And thank you for okay. coming thank in. You very much. Right. Thank you very much. Right, enjoy. We will link all those details um, okay. in our bio. Now, thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, do like and subscribe. I will be here every Monday morning with more exciting guests, challenging design perspectives. See you then.